decide their, the main question that's driving their topic. Um, and and that's it, that's, this is just a way for you to orient yourselves because it can be a little bit different. This goes really fast. It can be difficult to, to kind of keep track of things. What I would like you to do, Ken actually just gave me this brilliant little seed of an idea, and we're going to try to see if it works. As you have their individual questions here, but since we are a room full of drama curves and we are obsessed with connections, what I would like you to do as you're listening to each of these individual presentations, I would like you to listen for connections between presentations so that when they finish their presentations, your question has to be about a connection between two presentations. You can't just ask for about one presentation. You have to ask about two, okay? So those are your rules. Now I'm gonna tell you what their rules are so it doesn't freak you out. <laughs> so they each have five minutes to present. At four minutes, Rahaf is going to raise her hand and let them know that they have one minute left. They're going to acknowledge her so she's enough to keep her hand up for the, for the next minute. Then at five minutes, she's going to raise her hand back up, let them finish their point, close her fist, and then this is where they remember why they never wanted to be actors <laughs> or why they don't want to be actors anymore because they will, they will be told thank you and they're finished. <laughs> okay? So, so all that's going to happen from here on out is that they're going to come up here, they're going to tell you who they are, they're going to tell you your pronoun, uh, their pronouns, and then the, and then the timer is going to start. Okay? Um, and then I just have to say, Judith uh, had a... I'm here. You're here? Oh, you're here! Oh, excellent! Come on up! <laughs> just, to, just to hear so that you're, so that you're right here. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> um, okay. Well, so so now so that's great. Um, uh, then all I have to do is tell you that Shelley's flight got canceled, so she sent us the text of her presentation, and Brian is going to read it uh, after Desiree gives her presentation. Now, if you could all pull out the newsletter that you have, that's very important for Jeff's presentation. Yep, and I would like to invite <coughs> uh, Jeff Crow, he, him, his. So on one piece of paper, one, one side of the piece of paper you hold in your hands, the side with the photo, is a reproduction of the first issue of what would become the LMDA Review. And you can see that someone, in a great leap of faith, has labeled it Volume 1, Number 1, January 1986. Now, on the other side, you will see the first page of the first program for the first annual meeting of literary managers and dramaturgs of the Americas, August 21 to 23, 1986. Let's take a look at it first. After opening remarks by our first founding president, Alexis Green, we have our first panel, and I like how current it sounds. Artistic and professional goals in the face of financial <laughs> deficit. With Mark Bly, uh, David Copeland, Alexis Green, Joan Patchen, and Richard Pettengill, followed immediately and appropriately by a cocktail party. <laughs> a cash bar, of course. Um, except Ken gave us a free bar once, I remember that now. Uh, deficit in drinking, that was our beginning. Okay, so the second panel uh, at 10 the next morning on Friday, just like ours today, is on Dramaturgy for the Nonlinear Theater with Ann Catonio, Davies King, and Jonathan Marks. The third, after a two-hour lunch break, the Dramaturg is objective voice in rehearsal with Mark, and Oscar Eustace, and Emily Mann. So some of our earliest conversations confront distress, grapple with new forms, Think about how we interact with our collaborators. Um, the rest of that program is now available online and reminds us that despite all the work left to do, we here today are part of a long, rich, generous conversation. Alexis, by the way, is currently working on a book about Emily Mann. 
So let's turn the paper over and look at the first page of the first review in the archive, online and physical. This issue is incomplete. We only have pages one, six, seven, and eight, a gift to future scholars who can speculate about what those tantalizing <laughs> missing pages contain. But we do have in full an account of the first LMDA conference and a transcript of Des Makinov's keynote. The conference report, however, is not the first annual conference we just looked at, but a conference that took place about 10 months before the first, uh, the first uh, annual, before the first annual meeting. Now for this conference, the first LMDA conference of any kind, the only archival record we have is this article. And I love the uncontained exasperation of one sentence in particular. The object of this conference was to see if there could be a demonstration of what a dramaturg does rather than once again a series of unending panels during which panelists <laughs> try to define a term which, as this, this afternoon demonstrated, may be largely undefinable. <laughs> so that's a reminder that even in 1986, dramaturgs had been engaged in these sometimes maddening conversations for years with, as Joanna pointed out, unique traditions and lineages in Canada and the US. Now, both pieces in this first review offer useful insights into relatively early moments in the field. But what strikes me most about the first page of the first review is the face on its cover. Not so much for whose face it is, although that's important, Canadian and US citizen, Des McEnough, discussing in part his work with Robert Blacker, but for what this face suggests. No two of us I know will read this uh, in the same way with respect to its characteristics and identities. We could spend all day talking about that. But I have to say, I really like the lips <laughs> and the eyes. And perhaps most of all, the, the kind of union shadow that divides the face almost in two. We begin this story of who we are with a face, with the face of a collaborator, of someone looking at us full on, inviting us, it seems at least to me, to something rather wonderful. And now, over 40 years later, we have Robert's new book on Shakespearean dramaturgy, based in large part on his work with Des, with an introduction by Des as part of a whole series of books by a major press dedicated to dramaturgy, edited by Magda Romanska. So I think we may better understand the most recent writing in the field if we take a moment now and then to look back at this younger face of who we once were. Finally, thanks to everyone who's helped to make the archive possible, many in this room, with special mention today to Haviva Avram, who sat with and did much of the initial work uh, to my colleague, uh, Sarah Freeman, to Mark Bly, Laurie Sigliano for our work on the online uh, thing. And finally, a shout out to Jeremy Stoller, who continues his work with the newsletter, and to Kristen Leigh, who's going to edit the next edition. <laughs> That was great. Um, hi, I'm Tom Bryant, he, him. Uh, the question here is, uh, adaptation of history to drama, what are some of the concerns and choices playwrights face in the adaptation of history to drama, particularly in terms of current uh, cultural and political issues? And I'm much more interested in all your experiences. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of experiences in this area, but I know we all have opinions about this that are pretty diverse. Here, here are just some you know, points to kind of take off from, but I'm sure there are many, many more avenues. One, um, what are some of uh, the issues in the period today that uh, uh, are, are irrelevant or not as relevant in a particular period piece? In other words, how can you make a period piece or a historical period more relevant to today? Because sometimes it can be exciting in of itself in a period, but does it relate to today? And if so, why are we dramatizing this thing, et cetera? Uh, two, are the issues in the period uh, events that would be judged offensive to today's politics, cultural sensibilities? If so, you may have a historical event that's extremely important, but are contained within that so, so many kind of, you know, for instance, racism or sexism or homophobia that just the presentation of itself is, is kind of uh, problematical. That's another issue. Um, 
Are there appropriation issues, i.e. cultural elements by non additionists you know, people uh, adapting, say, cultural, per, you know, cultural uh, either history or practices of indigenous people. And you saw that, I think, clearly yesterday in the panel with uh, Jill, Monique, Spy, and Lindsay, you know, uh, an entire panel about the sensitivity towards those issues and how that might deal with things. Um, here's another like, side issue. How does the background of a specific writer influence how they deal with history? In other words, uh, a playwright of a given cultural, race, sexual orientation, background often creates a unique perspective. By the way, I'm not presenting these all as problems, but more as, you know, the whole process of how you adapt something. So does that give a unique perspective to the thing? If so, what way? Um, what are examples of, uh, shall we say, the issue of faithfulness to history, whatever that means? I mean, the entire question of whose history, from what point of view, immediately comes up. But there's a, but there's a kind of also an aesthetic issue attached to that. Um, in other words, when you depart from history in the instance of dramatizing something, it often seems like sometimes there's some kind of way in which that's judged to be acceptable, and other times that's judged to be completely unacceptable, either revisionist or uh, just untruthful. Where's the line there between uh, fudging history in a way that makes it, shall we say, more dramatizable, et cetera? Uh, anyway, th those are some of the main topics in terms of this idea of adaptation of, uh, of history and with dramaturgs and uh, playwrights face when they're adapting history. How much time do they have? Three minutes and 45 seconds. Okay. Let me give you one example. I, I worked with Lisa Loomer on Roe, uh, which is about, and this was in the context of OSF's uh, American Revolutions, or as it used to be known, the American History Project. So you had a very specific idea, which was you're supposed to adapt history. Well, the question is, how do you make that relevant today? Because what she was dealing with was a very specific period. Well, times, of course, have changed. So she has a unique uh, perspective as a Latina playwright. That entered in very heavily. One of her solutions was to introduce a character, for instance, at the end of the play, who literally stops the show, stands up and says, I'm, you know, I'm a young woman, I'm pregnant, what do I do? You see, in that way, Lisa's introducing a completely different perspective into what is essentially a historic piece. You could picture an adaptation of Roe being done mainly as a courageous attorney winning a case. In which case, what relevance does that have to today? And in fact, maybe even damaging because it creates the false illusion that this has been won, this has been taken care of, you see? Uh, I'm probably almost out of time. Anyway, you get, you get the idea. Um, what are some of the experiences you guys have had, or what are some of the opinions you have on the adaptation of history? That's my question. Hello, I'm Sean Sprankle, uh, SUNY Fredonia, and he, him, his. And what I'd like to talk about is broaching theoretical borders, the passage of time and its impact on theatrical texts. How should practitioners of theater approach the production of works as their meaning and context evolves with the passage of time? And how can we as dramaturgs play a vital role in the facilitation of this process? Um, and I'd, I'd like to discuss this kind of through the lens of my, my last year in undergrad, going through two particular productions. One which was uh, a production of Much Ado About Nothing, and the second being a production of Daisy Pulls It Off, two very kind of drastically different um, shows and just look, you know, kind of looking at how the approaches were different, specifically looking at the text. Um, when I, you know, the work that I had done on Much Ado, I was, was really excited because you know, this, there's, this show has just been you know, analyzed and reimagined so many times. There, there's, just, there's so much that you can do with, with the text in relation to the production. And when we got into the room, into the uh, design, like the design concept, one of the things that we just kind of immediately ran into was the approach was Shakespeare is timeless 
and it was it, the concept was the concept itself was very flat, and everything was kind of taken at face value. And for me as a dramaturg, one of the things that was kind of very disheartening about that was, you know, how how do we get you know, despite the fact that this text is hundreds of years old, how do we find new ways to breathe life into this and you know, kind of reevaluate it and reanalyze it for modern audiences? And that really wasn't the approach that was that was taken with our production. And I think that ultimately it kind of um, I think it, it hindered some of the things that we could do with it as far as uh, development of relationships and the characters and relating that to the audience. And on you know, the other side of it with Daisy Pulls It Off, um, from, from my experience and from my perspective, it was significantly more difficult than our production of Much Ado because some of the, um, some of the ideas about it heading into it, it as far as the text went was the source material was dated the show itself was dated and it was kind of limited to uh, community theater and amateur productions and other than occasionally being produced professionally in you know, Europe, specifically England, the approach from the designers and even um, the perspective from some of the actors was this show is really dated, I can't, rela I can't relate to this material, I can't relate to the characters and so kind of I took it upon myself to really sit down and say well no if we really break down this text, the source material, the historical context, social, political, cultural, we can add so much to this production. And across the experience of, the, of these two shows, it kind of, um, kind of put me in a position to question, you know, how do we approach different texts, different texts, and you know, kind of the perspectives <laughs> facing them. With, with you know, with Shakespeare, it was very let's look at this face value, let's take this for what it is, even though it's hundreds of years old. And with Daisy, it, the, the work was significantly newer, and I was shocked that the, the opinion was this material is dated, you know, it's, it's not going to stand up to the test of time. And, you know, that, that really put me in a position to question, well, is that really true? And how do we, how do we accurately evaluate the value of a text, especially um, comparatively looking at, you know, older texts, you know, the classics from the Greeks, the Romans, um, and then moving all the way up into more, more modern day uh, plays. And I just, I thought that that was, that was really interesting that that, was, that that had kind of arisen because I, you know, you always look at these, um, these productions as kind of a standalone, as separately. And I think that, you know, in, in my case, I felt that there, it really was the production, Daisy Pulls It Off as a whole, would have been drastically different without, without a dramaturg or without someone to really kind of um, imbue the text with new life and kind of uh, re really engage with the actors, with, with the, even with the designers, uh, some of whom were, uh, were faculty, who kind of had this very limited scope and this limited approach to what they saw in the text. And I think that you know, we as dramaturgs um, kind of can play a really vital role in um, kind of changing, changing the perspective and changing the, you know, the stigma that are attached with certain texts and certain productions. And so I, I would pose to all of you to kind of question how can we as dramaturgs uh, approach every production we, we do and look at the, the perception of that text as it stands and how does that fit what our production is doing and if it doesn't work, how can we change that and update it and, and make it fit without drastically shifting the, the core values of the text? Thank you. <coughs> Dennis Blasher, uh, she, her. In the last four years since I moved to Toronto from Istanbul for pursuing a doctoral degree in theater, I have achieved my ABD status in the theater program of University of Toronto, wrote four plays in English, translated my three Turkish plays into English, sent my plays to countless playwriting competitions, reached out to many academics and theater practitioners about my works, received mixed advice but mo mostly no response, uh, worked in all sorts of professional and student productions, and organized fundraising activities in Toronto. Throughout this long trial and error process of searching for a niche to work in Toronto in terms that I can agree politically and artistically, I ultimately and brutally failed because of institutional racism that politely masks itself through professionalism. In my experience with Toronto theater community, 
Professional has always been a term that hides first world supremacy and English language supremacy again and again, leaving no breathing space even in the margins to make mistakes and experiment for newcomer and second language English speaker theater artists. Professionalism, a great all-encompassing discourse with its immunity to criticism of institutional racism, simultaneously has the capacity to bend its rules for the group of its in-group. Uh, this particular professionalism also insistently and unapologetically labels all aesthetics other than the Anglo-Canadian realism, which is taught in theater schools across English Canada as the norm, as amateurish. After four years of constant struggle in this realm, I decided to quit trying to work in Toronto altogether. But since now I feel like I know what Toronto theater wants from an immigrant artist, I want to share my hard-gained wisdom with you based on the experiences of many immigrant theater artists I know, including myself. Here is a list of what the immigrant theater practitioner needs to do to become a part of the super multicultural and all welcoming theater community in Toronto. <laughs> One, don't, speak, uh, don't try to speak for yourself. Find an available white female theater practitioner who thinks that personal empathy and state funds are the basis of theater and has no idea about political solidarity in dark times. Give her your authentic story so she can speak on your behalf uh, through using your works in a verbatim play and become a successful theater practitioner. Remember that fiction is the field of people who are born with a Western passport, so never dare to talk beyond your authentic experiences and go along with the fetishization of your life on stage. Two, if you insist to talk for yourself, remember that immigrant theater practitioners' work can only be about how horrible their home country was and how great Canada is and how grateful, how grateful they are to be in Canada. It is more preferable if you can tell this theme as a small family drama. Three. <laughs> Aesthetically, it must be kitchen sink realism, and the play should take place in its entirety in one or at most two domestic settings. If you are going to have one domestic setting, it must be the living room of the small immigrant family in Canada, and if you are going to have two settings, one should be the living room in the horrible home country, and the other should be the living room in the amazing Canada. <laughs> uh, if you manage to finally stage a play, you should always be grateful and constantly demonstrate how grateful you are, again and again. But don't expect to have a second play under any condition, since the diversity quota is used for you enough times already. Five. If you ever gain any success in theater, you should always remember that it is not due to your hard work and agency, but due to the open-heartedness and kindness of the Canadian theater community. <laughs> Six, if you actually manage to stage your intergenerational family kitchen sink drama with the bright eye note at the end that masks, marks how amazing Canada is, never forget that you have to cast people with clean and ironed English with no bastard accents. If there's an accent needed on the stage, make sure that you cast a person who can mimic that accent, but never someone that actually speaks in that accent. After your amazing casting choices, shamelessly become a part of the larger and endless debates in Toronto theater community about what is real and authentic in theater and never feel any disgust because of the perpetual hypocrisy. Actually, you will have a way better chance of success if you are not aware of it completely. And last but not the least, seven, never dare to act as if you're an artist with a remarkable past and intellectual capacity, and remember that your Canadian fellow artists will never have anything to learn from you, even if you were a national celebrity in your home country. Since they are very polite and nice people, let them educate you about theater and obey them unconditionally, because if you don't, they will collectively gaslight you, masking their institutional racism as professionalism, and shun you from all theater resources politely. Thank you. Sullivan, she, her, hers. Um, the question I'm asking is, um, how does a search for the nexus of dramaturgy and marketing lead to a reframing and reorientation of the conversation surrounding diversity and equity inclusion, especially when it comes to uh, nonprofit institutions in the United States? Um, 
at the beginning, this is this was the essential question that I'm still asking um, four weeks after I turned in my master's thesis. Um, my master's thesis began as the search for uh, the nexus between dramaturgy and marketing, as it is a place where I seem to live professionally. Um, and I thought I would find that by trying to understand the conversation surrounding diversity and equity inclusion, especially it pertains to programming and season planning in uh, nonprofit institution nonprofit institutions in America. Um, and as I did that, and as I worked and worked to understand the conversation, um, I found myself needing to reorient it and reframe it. And so how I did that is still a mystery to me. Um, I, sought, I sought to do that as I fell down this wormhole um, by taking a, a broad longitudinal survey as the conversation that I saw it. Um, broad because it, it went across conversations. It didn't just look at the conversation of gender parity or the conversation around um, racial, uh, racial inclusion and equity or inclusion of people with disabilities um, or the needs of, of people with families and how to accommodate them, but it tried to look at people speaking on all of these topics and the commonalities of what they had to say. Um, it was also longitudinal in that I worked to go back to the 1990s, knowing that you could probably go even earlier, but that's, um, that's where I, I chose to kind of keep my uh, cap on it. Um, and in doing so, I ended up reorienting the conversation as I saw it for myself, because in the beginning, I saw it as, as I said, a conversation of conversations that felt very cacophonous to me. And I ended up reorienting it as I looked at both um, what leading artistic directors and playwrights and dramaturgs had to say, as well as what marketers had to say, arts marketers had to say. Um, looking at it more as, as Joanna Chef Bernstein would say, as a, a continuum of arts-oriented and market-oriented choices. Um, I then ended up trying to, having to reframe the conversation um, by looking, again, not at those specific conversations, but looking more at what people had to say about what they thought, what they thought institutions were for and who they were for and how they defined exactly who that, who, who they're for is um, and how all of that defines how institutions value work and, and the values that they espouse. Um, and I did that, and as I, as I did that, um, I came up with what I found is a, a spectrum of perspectives that has two pretty distinct poles that you will hear sometimes, but oftentimes people lie more in the middle. Um, and what, as I did that, um, what I started seeing coalescing um, in, ter in terms of my own making as I knew it, um, I, I started to find an artist-oriented perspective and an audience-oriented perspective and then an eco-perspective, ecosystem perspective that would tie it all together. Um, the artist-oriented perspective would be maybe the kinds of things that you've heard um, with the idea that art, that because art reflects artists and therefore reflects, you know, the identity of the, art, of the artistic director of a company, that therefore companies, companies serve artists and are part of an artist community and therefore, um, when, especially when it comes to back into the conversation surrounding diversity and equity inclusion, the people who had that perspective um, would be the kind of people who are saying that the way to achieve diversity and equity inclusion would be to um, to have a more to hire a more diverse staff, um, diverse in, in all the kind of ways that you would want, and that those people will therefore choose more diverse programming um, that way. Whereas the audience-oriented perspective, One minute. sorry, One minute. thank you. Uh, whereas the audience-oriented perspective was the kind that you might hear um, where people say that theaters serve communities and that they need to reflect uh, the communities around them in, in all their diversity and that in your, in your programming, um, if you work harder to, uh, to reflect that community um, in your programming, then therefore you will need um, a, more, a more diverse and inclusive and equitable base of artists to, to do that programming well. Um, I then found, as I did that, um, an ecosystem perspective that's kind of in two parts. Um, it connects these two poles because there's so much, there's, there's so many opinions that can kind of be in between by again looking at a continuum of arts, of arts oriented and market oriented decision making that really <coughs> brings these two values together. Um, but what also, uh, a perspective that also says that companies can be one, can be oriented towards one or the other and that both of those um, can actually exist in our theater, in theater, um, ecos our theater industry ecosystem and feed each other and actually having both of these kinds of companies um, or a mix in between um, um, would give you, um, would help you 
create more diversity and equity inclusion and I'm looking to see if, if that's a perspective that, um, if this is a way of looking at it that people find valid and useful and helpful and how it can um, go wider. So. Thank you. her hers. I decided to collect some interviews uh, to collect ideas on how dramaturge might work with a performance artist creating non-repeatable work. So my own questions include uh, why would I repeat if it only serves to perpetuate colonial thinking patterns? If theater is tied up with colonial gaze, is there a way out? How do I disrupt my own habits of perception in the creation process? If art works if art works towards potential understanding, wouldn't it be better to develop my performance-making practices of rigorous attention to possibilities rather than the narrowing down of choices? Wouldn't this drive a dramaturg mad trying to get me to commit to things when everything that is decided is potentially the problem that needs to be identified and overcome? And how uh, can we imagine other people uh, receiving the work when we haven't met these people yet? Uh, what can a dramaturg do um, if we take the situation of unpredictability as a given? Is the dramaturg always trying to anchor into what is known? What if we intentionally do not know, want to know the outcome? Is there a particular opportunity for the dramaturg in this situation? Rick Knowles wrote me that planning process is always better than pre-envisioning results. The anchor is in the doing. And that collaboration across difference as much as possible ensures that all of art taken for granted will be destabilized in unpredictable ways. Some of these questions involve what are the component parts and how they fit together, how, what do the relationships between components do, and how uh, will the show make folks sit differently. My friend uh, and outside eye, Fiona Griffiths, said, you have to be someone doing something somewhere at some time for some reason, even when you're improvising, and it needs to be in the body. Fiona suggests a daily practice of making lists about fears, ecstasies, things you want to see on stage, actions, edit those lists, improvise based on each word, begin to begin creating gestures, and um, but you're always tethered to these concepts that are meaningful to you. She spoke of the coach as having the body of keeping uh, the body of the performer on track and the dramaturg as having the job of keeping the world of the performance on track, but she also spoke of um, finding where those two circles intersect. She spoke about a need for intellectual rigor to discuss concepts, pol politics, philosophy, to be doing something, you have to know the world you're in. We are hardwired to have a world, um, um, Anyway, sorry, an exam of words. Um, and to actually deal with each layer. She spoke about people often hiding in performance and being in a state where they can't take responsibility for their actions sometimes in a dis dissociative state. She talks about being in solo influence and both you have to feel and sense the audience. In speaking to Amy Henderson, who is, does not consider herself a dramaturg, but she has um, acted for me as an outside eye with dramaturgical thinking, and she's asking questions um, She's, uh, she's working on reading what is happening already by supporting people in a way that allows the artwork in the process to become the site of intelligence and it folds the performers into conversations that languages the work so that the site of the, those articulations are not in one person's domain so there isn't a binary between the people who do and the people who think. For me she suggests the questions, what do we need for this to be a thing? What do you need to practice on the inside to trust your decisions or to know the durations of things? Is this a piece about deciding on the durations of things. And what's the dramaturgy of your particular process, which has as its main inquiry a lack of repeatability? And what kind of process needs to develop between you and someone to create the dramaturgy that's appropriate for the work you want to do? Jacob Zimmer, he sees dramaturgy as a relationship between individuals. As a dra dance dramaturg, Jacob has hired as a curious, curious outsider toward emergent practices. He's noting what he's seeing and what it makes him feel, the associations he's having, the things he's thinking about as he's watching. He's interested in dramaturgy of the event more than the piece. How do we create the conditions for the work to succeed? To succeed? What is success? What feelings do we want to be left with? Do we want the audience to walk alone in the streets and reflect? Or do we want everyone clapping and singing at the end? Of the, at the end? Uh, we can work on a show that does that. He prefers audience-focused questions and legibility. What are they expecting? He invites the audience in. He wants to make people feel welcome. He wants to feel they have an understanding of what's going on. We're about to do something hard. It's important for you to know that I'm not an asshole. Uh, how, how do I prepare you uh, for the hard thing we are going to do together? 
I will break the rules for a laugh because I'm more interested in the immediacy of the relationship between audience and performer towards reciprocal hospitality. Regarding non-repeatable, how do you make structures that you can do more than once but you still have a deciding body on stage? How does a person do a thing? A dramaturg can help with that, but there has to be a layer of readability. How is there a layer of the show that is a clear path for, that people can hook onto? Something familiar around which strangeness can happen. What are the rules and how do we know them? Lucas Olskamp, uh, the dramaturg is trying to speak into existence what's already going on in the room through observation, translation, and deep listening. He's aiming to create an unspoken flow, designing the roller coaster of the show, how can we make the journey do what we want it to do, to structure according to how you want to affect people, taking deep embodied structural experiences from his life, not necessarily connected to the content, but choosing structures to layer on uh, that can split open the work. It's not about metaphor, it's to not let the dramaturgy take over the story, it's a translation of structures in his point of view. Uh, an embodied dramaturgy that creates behavioral accordances. Time when, up. Time's up? Yes. Uh, Um, Sarah Freeman, University of Puget Sound, she, her, hers. Every four years, the University of Puget Sound Race and Pedagogy Institute hosts a national conference. In collaboration with the University of Washington doctoral student Monica Cortez Viarjo and students from my Spring Projects and Dramaturgy class, I'm creating a performance walk for the September 2018 conference in Tacoma. The walk aims to take participants through Tacoma's hilltop neighborhood and remember, map, and imaginatively explore the civil rights activism that shaped Tacoma. I proposed this hot topic in order to update LMDA about our process, engaging existing oral histories and local and campus archives, and to preview the emerging form of the walk. First, however, I have to call the names of how I got here. I could never have conceived the form of this project without the examples provided to me by LMDA artists and scholars. I encountered the performance walk form as part of my research about alternative British theater companies, but without the work of Shelley Orr, DJ Hopkins, and Kim Solga at LMDA and ASTR conferences and in their publications, uh, I would not have such rich framing. All of the work around dramaturgy in the city and the conference planning that went into conferences around those themes by, say, Jane Barnett matters. I absorbed it during a period when I was not able to attend LMDA conferences regularly but was still soaking in all the work shared here. I noticed that the ATHE program uh, shows the dramaturgy focus group doing an exciting set of sessions about the dramaturgy of various walks around uh, trails in Boston um, in August, so I see that work continues. And um, I'm going to call the name of Laronica Thomas and her synthesis of many conversations brewing around notions of civic dramaturgy and the type of things we saw in the um, Secret Life of Canada podcast plenary yesterday. So all of those dramaturgical sensibilities have inspired me. The update is, I am at the juncture of the work where I do not know what we have. <laughs> I'm asking what Jeff Kroll taught me is the fundamental dramaturgical question, the one Lee Devin frames in his essay for Dramaturgy in American Theater on conceiving the forms. What are the parts of this thing and how do they go together? I know the parts. We have a set of existing oral history interviews from the Tacoma Civil Rights Project that happened between 2005 and 2008. We have the short documentary film created by the TCRP. We have additional oral history interviews and papers from the Community History Program run by professors Mike Honey and Michael Sullivan at UW Tacoma. And we have a recording of a story circle among four African American women that I just conducted with Monica on June 3rd. We have access to archival materials in the Northwest Reading Room at the Tacoma Public Library, the Tacoma Historical Society, the Washington State History Museum, and the University of Puget Sound Special Collections. We have the experience of walking the neighborhood, and we have 11 walk visions created by my projects and dramaturgy students for their finals at the end of spring semester. Those parts are made up of parts, themes, <laughs> sense memories, genealogical narrations, news reports, poems, attempts to notice patterns, attempts to recreate certain lived experiences, attempts to preserve buildings, strategies for acknowledging absences in the physical landscape. The themes that repeat have to do with, one, the legacy of redlining, juxtapositions of the past fight for fair housing with the present accelerating gentrification in Tacoma. Two, the role of churches in gathering people together for action. And three, the surprise of how racism works in a place that uh, some people describe as God's country uh, and seem to be unlike either the South or the Northeast in terms of racism in the mid-century. Ha ha. There is something going on with generations. 
the stories of elders, the absence of younger generations. There is something going on with needing to figure out what concrete reforms could be made now, legislatively or with other types of policy or institutions. I have to be honest, I have no idea how it all goes together. I know we have resonant material. I know we have plenty of space in which to walk. I know we have about an hour for the walk. I know there's too much to do before September. <laughs> So, as I update LMDA now on the project of dramaturgy, community history, and action, I would have to say it takes so much more conceiving than anything I have done before. Conceiving the form of a dramatic text means engaging with something already aesthetically shaped. It is a truism of historians that the past does not have a form. We only give it form by writing about it, retelling it, and turning it into narrative and art. I know this as a historian. I am now feeling it as an artist. Is that five? Thank you. Hello, I'm Judith Rudikoff, York University, Toronto. Yes, I said it with a T, Toronto. We also say it that way. Don't let anybody tell you different. Um, <laughs> the pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, the question that I want to ask today or begin with is, how do you dramaturg work inspired by the playwright's life? And what are the questions to ask to start the evolution of fact into interpretation? Now, arguably, that's what making theater is. We take something we know to be true, and then we embroider it or we reinterpret it. But I'm working on a very particular project right now. I'm working with a mother and daughter, both who identify as queer women. And they wanted to explore their, their lives, but not explore their lives. <laughs> so my first point of departure was uh, to ask them, uh, what if? The, st the questioning that we began with was, what if you had made different decisions at any point in either of your lives? And how would that have impacted on how your path through life progressed? That gave us three sets of characters. The playwright, Mother, is Lois Fine, who some of you may know from her play that premiered at Buddies in Bad Times Theatre a couple of years ago, Frida and Jem's Best of the Week. It was also given a stage reading at the Rhinoceros Theatre in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Her daughter, Sadie Epstein Fine, is the intern artistic director at Nightwood Theatre, one of our most well-known and longest running feminist theatre companies in the country. And she's also an associate artist at uh, Theatre Direct Canada, a theatre for young audiences. So we started with the what if. And what we discovered was Lois's big what if was, what if I hadn't come out? What if I had led a closeted life as a cisgendered, heterosexual, <coughs> married woman? What would that have been? What would my life have been? And that led us down all kinds of a variety of rabbit holes, not just one. Sadie's question was, what if I did not have a secure home environment? What if my life had not been uh, protected? What if I didn't start from a position of power and privilege? What would that have done to me as a queer, queer spawn, which is how she identifies? We started to jam on that, and we came up with three sets of mothers and daughters. Not surprisingly, one set of mother and daughter is called Lois and Sadie. And again, not surprisingly, those are the hardest ones for them to work on. Mm -hmm. it, there's just, it, there's all kinds of problems inherent in trying to write about yourself but not yourself, they started calling the play Beside Myself. Uh, the three types of questions that we've asked so far are the what if, what if things had been different and you had made different choices, confessions, what is something that your mother character or your daughter character wants to confess to the other person, and why here, why now? Why are we looking at this particular section of the characters' lives at this juncture in their life? Once we had a loose set of three narratives, we started finding points of intersection and braiding them together. What I'm interested in hearing from those of you assembled here is other types of questions that you think might be good provocations. Because we find ourselves now at a point where we've been working for two years, and we, we have a script. 
we're just not happy with it yet. We, well, arguably, you're never going to be happy with it. But it's, it's such a, an intense labor of love that we're all, and I count myself in this position as well, we're in a place now where we don't have any distance anymore, and we're starting to run out of questions to ask each other. When Lois and Sadie started writing, I asked them to write separately. And they looked at me like I was clinically insane, but it worked because the characters didn't always know each other. Thank you. Um, now they're, then they started writing monodramas. Now we're at the stage where they're writing scenes, two-handed scenes, and they're writing together. So they'll take a week and go somewhere secluded and they'll just work on writing and improvising. But I'd like to hear from the assembled people if you have any ideas for where to go next or how we can move this further. Thank you. dramaturgical education and experience, and I would say chops, has to do with, and this is like, harkens back to what Sarah said, um, how the parts fit together to make a whole, and what kind of expertise do I have to notice um, an incipient form, like a form that's, a, that's possible, and to recommend ways of adjusting the parts to make different holes, um, adding parts, subtracting parts, considering alternative um, holes the experience. The project that I've been working on, with, uh, the company I work with, Headlong, uh, from about 2012 to 2018, um, invited me to um, consider a different way of looking at dramaturgy, which is, given that the form is going to evolve as it does, as an organism might evolve, what is my work then? I, my expertise in saying like, ooh, 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 go this way, make it this way, is, uh, is not really welcome, not really useful. So here's some, here's some background, I'll see how much I, I can get through in five minutes. Also, um, if you wanted to, those of you who are online, if you wanted to go to thequietcircus.com, and it's thequietcircus.com, uh, while I'm talking and look at the photographs in the gallery, you'll have a, a better sense of what it is that's uh, that's going on in the piece. You could also visit that, that site later. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what the piece was. Uh, so to our funders, the Quiet Circus was a 15 month long community art project that included 36 weekly performances that took place on the Washington Avenue Pier in South Philadelphia, which is the former site of an immigrant processing facility. Um, and it's now a sort of a public park in the new sort of highline fashion of uh, rugged landscaping and um, <laughs> pleasant, quiet places to um, sit. Uh, uh, the Quiet Circus also included four events that used uh, guest performances to address other sites along the Del Delaware River. And those four events had different, um, different ideas about dramaturgy than what I'm talking about. Um, to the audience of these um, year and a half worth of events, we were largely invisible. Uh, we didn't publicize this work. There were no like bus um, side that said like, woohoo, come see site specific um, performance. Um, we didn't want people to think of themselves as an audience. Um, and we didn't want them coming to us expecting the sort of um, virtuosic, skill-based, Amaz amazingness um, that dance often um, has, has associated with it, or the so-called magic of theater, which uh, to us for this purpose was mostly as associated with what we thought of as, what I think of as the stench of art. Um, and we didn't want that. We wanted people to just come and see um, in the course of their daily lives what it is that we were up to and to notice it as 
perhaps different than the way that they experienced that site on other occasions, but not necessarily to experience it indexed as like, oh my goodness, look at what the artists are doing. <laughs> so until the word eventually got out, these weekly events were made for audiences who didn't think of themselves as audiences. They thought of themselves as folks going for walks or runs or bike rides. Uh, they thought of themselves as people taking their kids out of, ha out of the house <coughs> on Saturday morning so that their spouse could sleep or uh, people who lived um, in the brush or behind the big box stores that littered the neighborhood. Um, why did we do this? We did this uh, because we wanted to um, step out of what I thought of as, or what I talked about as uh, this um, world of virtuosity. We wanted to create uh, what we came to call a luminous world. Uh, that related the everyday to something that's just a little bit different than it. Um, and we wanted to make our work, and I think this is the most important thing for me, thinking about it now, um, in relationship to practice instead of to product. Right? So that there was never a sense of like, ah yes, this is the production. There was a sense of this is our practice, this is what we do every week. If nobody sees it, that's really fine. Um, if a hundred people come and see it, that's actually okay too, or a little bit suboptimal because it's it's hard to make accommodations for so many people. Uh, but our practice evolved over um, many years um, and and sort of culminated in this 15 month long section. Um, I'm really interested in talking to anybody or hearing questions from people or observations about folks who have worked on. Um, pieces that treat form in similar ways. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Morgan Granbo, she, her, hers. Um, alongside uh, Luke Daniel Wright, we will be talking about um, undergraduate dramaturgy mentorship and from our specific graduate uh, perspective. Uh, we are both MFA candidates at the University of Iowa and these experiences have come out of two productions that we worked on there. Um, at our university we have a unique um, opportunity to collaborate with undergraduates on a regular basis which is phenomenal. Um, and I think we have a, a pretty strong uh, dramaturgy program but it's not necessarily reflected in the undergraduate population or taken um, advantage of to its fullest. Uh, in attempts to combat this, uh, we both took on assistant dramaturgs for our main stage productions, myself for a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Luke for a production of By the Way, Meet Barris Stark. Um, today I'd like to share uh, some possible best practices, we can call them, uh, for mentoring in dramaturgy, especially for some of the other early career dramaturgs in the room that can also be doing this. Um, so, some of the things that I would like to consider musts, uh, schedule and commit to frequent and structured one-on-ones. Uh, I think this is essential to the process and for their learning experience. Um, for us, this meant uh, once a week for an hour or so, just a touch base. Um, this includes planning and setting goals for the following week, touching base on what the major questions were in the rehearsal room. and looping them into any significant developments or conversations that happened while they were absent, and then creating an environment where they can bring up concerns or questions can be addressed. Um, for our midsummer, that included live music, um, complex doubling, a full understudy cast within the company, um, a relatively abbreviated text. This was pretty essential for our diving deep into what we found were the challenges of the piece and challenges of a, a concept or director-driven Shakespeare. Um, most importantly, I think a significant chunk of time should be scheduled for after the process to debrief on their experience and your own um, and prepare to discuss what they can continue to work on as it will be asked. Um, another must, I think, is tangible contribution to at least one element of dramatic writing. Uh, I actually think I could have done a little better with the structuring of this. This requires significant planning um, and discussion early in the collaboration. I was able to include um, my undergraduate assistant in the compilation of our rehearsal packet, uh, but I wish I was able to foresee including him strategically in the program note or the lobby display, whether on a research level or contributing to the writing um, of one of those elements. 
I think the practice of writing about theater and our productions is so critical that it must be one of the first tasks that we learn is required and begin to hone. Um, and then moving from must but to like if at all possible, I think that allowing and encouraging agency when we have assistance is really significant. Personally, I encouraged my assistant uh, dramaturg to attend rehearsals when I had gone out of town for a festival and he would email me brief summaries of what occurred at the rehearsal while I was away. Um, it felt like a useful exercise in listening, finding the kernel of a concern or a revelation, and then putting it down in writing. Um, additionally, I encouraged him to include any questions he had for the team and myself, and that if anything felt extremely urgent, that he should speak to the assistant director. Um, this is where I assume many people may have trepidation, uh, but it speaks to a larger point of making sure that you trust and have really communi open communication with the collaborators that we choose to bring on projects with us. And then just like a final thought on this before I turn it over to Luke is, I think that being open to working with an assistant vocally is very significant. Um, I think it's important that we make ourselves available to undergraduates and early career individuals who are looking to assist or shadow or to hone some of their dramaturgical writing. Um, while many of the spaces that we inhabit are complex, especially new playrooms, um, we can use these opportunities on established plays to teach newcomers the intricacies of being a dramaturg in the rehearsal space. Um, I believe this type of openness can also translate to our friends from other disciplines who have noticed but not necessarily exercised their dramaturgically leaning brains. Um, and just that there is more than enough space for us all, including uh, the, the groups that are very much underrepresented in our field, and I feel that this should be another pathway that we actively utilize more often. Um, I'll now pass things off to Luke, who's going to speak a little more chronologically in the question. Thank you, Morgan. Um, yes, uh, Luke White, uh, he, him, his. Um, I want to share my own thoughts on best practices and mentoring. Um, I took on an undergraduate assistant, a dramaturg on a production of Lynn Nottage's By the Way, Meet Vera Stark. Um, as Morgan mentioned, uh, we have quite a large undergraduate theater program at the University of Iowa. Uh, but we lack any system of recruitment in the way that auditions uh, formally invite would-be actors to participate. Uh, my assistant for Meet Vera Stark came to me quite by chance. Um, however, I would argue that the first step in cultivating undergraduate dramaturgs would be to establish a stronger means of inviting interested students to participate. Uh, one possible solution I propose, something my own undergraduate theater program did, is to include dramaturgy in conversations about production assignments when we assemble creative teams. Um, curious students can then be directed to dramaturgically inclined faculty members for conversation that would marry the student's interest and experience to the dramatur dramaturgical needs of the upcoming uh, productions and season. Um, in considering my mode of mentorship for Meet Vera Stark, I turned to my own entry point for dramaturgy as an undergrad uh, assisting. Um, I do believe this to be the best approach for introducing students to our often nebulous and malleable discipline. Uh, in this way, the entry experience becomes a meaningful process of active participation and observation. Uh, as we began our process and all throughout, I, find, I found it useful to carefully explain the many decisions that I had to make for the production, uh, from what to include in our glossary, what to deliver in our dramaturgical presentation to the cast, when to attend rehearsals, etc. I made every attempt to explain my rationale. Uh, in this way, I believed I helped to clarify for my assistant a way of thinking dramaturgically, uh, a mode of attentive judgment grounded in the needs of the play and our fellow artists. Uh, our communication in one-on-one -on -one meetings was positive and free-flowing. Uh, however, I made it clear that when we entered the rehearsal hall, I would be the one to speak at the table on our behalf. Um, I felt this was important for two reasons. Uh, one was that I wanted my assistant first to observe the professional decorum of the rehearsal um, before contributing to it herself. And the second reason was uh, the sensitive nature of our play, by the way, Meet Vera Stark. Uh, a play which untangles the legacy of problematic black representation in early Hollywood. Um, I knew it would be difficult material uh, with which to grapple, especially for our artists of color in the room. I knew conversations and table work would not be easy to navigate and that I, especially as a white artist, needed to approach my collaborators with humbleness and extreme empathy as I presented difficult history uh, they would have to represent on stage. Um, I thought it would be better to lead my assistant, uh, who was also white, by example with the sort of care that I wanted to practice in the room. Um, 
I would check in with my assistant during rehearsal breaks and at the end of rehearsals to see whether she had any questions about the process and to ask for any thoughts she had. After a few days of working like this, I encouraged her to pass me notes uh, with thoughts and questions as they arose. Um, through this, uh, she demonstrated to me that she was actively observing and understanding the nature of our role in the room, uh, thus earning my trust in her emerging dramaturgical sensitivity, sensibility. Uh, eventually, I found moments uh, where I encouraged her to uh, contribute to the conversation herself when we came across topics in the text that I knew she was well versed in from our research process. As we moved into attending runs and tech, uh, I even gave her room to express some of her own observations directly to our faculty director, and she began to relish the dramaturg satisfaction of having moved, helped move her fellow artists a step forward. Um, when all was said and done, I was really thankful for this opportunity. It struck me that even if this particular student does not go on to act as a dramaturg on another production, uh, she will inevitably bring her newfound dramaturgical sensitivity uh, to future theatrical uh, projects uh, and collab collaborators. Uh, and I believe training as many undergrads in this way can only contribute to the artistic ecology uh, at our university in positive ways. Uh, for my own, I am reminded of the wisdom which says that the best way to learn something is to teach it. Uh, I gained newfound clarity for my own dramaturgical process, its strengths and areas I can approve. Um, a valuable moment of self-reflection that will help me move forward in my training at the university. Thank you. is what is the role of the dramaturg when there's a change in direction or even when there's multiple directors in the room so this was one of my first um, times being a dramaturg and I didn't really know what to expect and the faculty director was very encouraging and wanted my role to be as collaborative as I wanted it to be um, I read a books of what dramaturgy was I read production notebooks and I was like okay I'm not really sure what to expect but here we go so, <laughs> I attended auditions after reading the script with the director, um, just typical listening to the note of his experience because he was in the original production. Um, I listened to his vision for the production and his interventions. I researched influences um, that the designers had and how that would impact the young audiences because this was a theater for young audiences piece. And I annotated and decoded the script along with collaborating with others in the room, including the assistant director who was an MFA student at the time. Due to some unforeseen health issues, our faculty director had to step away from the project with all intention of coming back a couple months later. And the assistant director, who was the MFA student, took over this role as the director. The MFA was very attached to this project because this was the basis for his thesis. And um, I believe that he wasn't ready for the heavy responsibility because he wasn't expecting it. And because he was unaware of the role and the impact of the dramaturg, this led to the dramaturg being seen as superfluous in rehearsal and not contributive to the creative process. This young director would sometimes act unprofessionally towards me, towards our stage management team, and sometimes other actors in the room. After a month or two under the direction of this student, the faculty decided it might be a best idea to have a faculty director supervising the student. Um, <laughs> Yes, after months. Um, <laughs> so the faculty member who stepped in, um, she was the complete opposite of this MFA student. Of course, she had years of experience under her belt. She was very creative and collaborative and um, open-minded and took the original director's um, ideas and tried to streamline it through as much as she could. Um, and she actually stepped in when this, the MFA director had to leave for two weeks. So as he had to leave, she stepped in, and once again, I was the only one left in the room. <laughs> so in conclusion, <laughs> the question, um, so what does the change in direction mean for my role as the dramaturg? During this five to six month journey as a first time dramaturg, I was still trying to figure out who I stood by. Was my role towards that? playwright um, who has passed. Was I an advocate for the original director's vision because we created trust and um, I knew what he wanted at the end of the play. Because he had the, all the intention of coming back to the play, but he ended up not. Um, or was I an advocate for the new directors who came in with their own visions? 
Throughout the change of direction and unfortunate experience, I realized that my role as a dramaturg for this project was imperative. I was one of the only collaborators there throughout the entire rehearsal process. I was a debriefer and a reminder of past conversations and decisions made by other directors. I also realized that my role was also to myself. There came a time in the rehearsal process towards the very end, luckily, before opening night that I had to take myself out of the rehearsals um, to avoid any more negativity from directors or other cast members. Because I didn't have a permanent director, there was no opportunity for trust or respect to form and grow. And I was in an environment where others doubted, dismissed, or respected me and my contributions. I'm Brian Moore from Portia University in Nebraska, co-convener, uh, he, him, his, uh, presenting on behalf of Shelley Orr, San Diego State University. As the dramaturgy advisor, you have it all set up. The first year MA student is assigned to a show in the spring semester. She can participate in the whole process beginning halfway through the fall semester after she has gotten her bearings and started to participate fully in the life of the department. The faculty director is pro-dramaturg and promotes a highly collaborative rehearsal process. Check, check, check. That was the plan. <laughs> and now, four moments from the reality. Moment one, when you receive the email that your colleague, the faculty director, will need to have a major surgery several months earlier than planned. He ends up missing the whole semester. His classes have to be covered, but also the production that he has been shepherding through the conceptual and design process. Never fear, he has an assistant director. An MFA student has been on board throughout and is poised and eager to take on the role of the director. Moment two, when you meet with your student dramaturg, she sits in your office and carefully explains how she has felt publicly rebuked and her input dismissed in front of the whole company by the assistant director who is now the director. He has been borderline rude to several members of the company and has put a definite chill on the collaborative process. Moment three, when you meet with the director's faculty advisors, describe the problem and they seem shocked. They have never seen him act in this way before in the 18 months that they have been in this pro he has been in this program. This moment is followed quickly by the moment when you meet with said director and talk about the importance of fostering a collaborative spirit and the importance of treating all members of the team with respect and the importance to the success of the program that the director lead with a tone that is encouraging and that honors the contributions of everyone as he nods and claims that it is exactly what he has been doing. <laughs> Moment four, when you meet with your advisee again and make suggestions as to how she might proceed because while you are the advisor and this is part of her program of study and you are giving her a grade, having the students buy in on the next steps is central to the overall success or failure of this experience in which so much has already been invested. Surely, we have all learned a lot from rehearsal processes that have been less than ideal, but of course, that is not what we hope for in the theatrical collaborations that we engineer as faculty. So, how best to advise? In this case, I lay out a limited number of options for the student to consider and then ask for her input on the next step. I also request that the department chair provide more oversight and guidance to the assistant now director. Predictably, predictably, the chair is already well aware as other students has been in his office complaining of ill treatment. I advised my students that she could, one, continue as she had been, attending rehearsals regularly, nearly daily, and participating by contributing to the discussions and feedback sessions. That, of course, may involve exposing herself to continued poor treatment from the director in front of the company. I reminded her that the director is also a student who was learning to direct, and he had yet to become secure enough in his authority to let some of it go. I further suggested that she could, too pull back on attending rehearsal and focus instead on the audience-centered items like the program note in the lobby display. And I offered her option three, to stop attending rehearsal and to do minimal work, further work on the show. I felt that she needed to set her level of involvement from this point forward. Obviously, as advisors, we want our students to have wonderful theatrical experiences that help them see that collaboration is a fulfilling way to work. An exciting journey, best taken with a team of trusted partners. But we all know that not every theatrical experience is like that. But we want theatrical experiences to be positive. In the laboratory environment of school, 
as that is often considered to be a foundational working model for the students' careers. But as has been, become even more crystal clear in recent months, there are times when students are mistreated and even abused, and we certainly don't want them exposed to those situations. We also know that when our students come to us with a problem, the situation is already pretty in advance. So when do we advise a student to stick with a difficult rehearsal? And when do we advise them to remove themselves? There are no simple answers, but clearly it is under our purview as advisors to intervene when necessary to make sure the climate of collaboration is productive and safe for all involved. Perhaps the LMBA U caucus could explore the development of an advisor's handbook with information and resources to draw upon. Thank you. So I think maybe the next uh, best thing to do would be to have all of you, all the presenters, uh, grab your chair and bring it up to the stage. If anybody needs help, just let us know. And um, as they are getting set up, I want to remind you of your job as dramaturgs in the room uh, to help us identify uh, connections between the various presentations. Um, uh, maybe with some questions. These could be observations or questions. Is there enough room? Have I really? We'll make it. Okay. We'll be cozy. Uh, you could also sit at the front of the stage if there aren't oh. enough. Oh, you want to get in here? Yeah. Sure. Oh, there's more than enough seats now. Oh. It's okay. All righty. Let's see. So we have about 13 minutes <laughs> for a profound conversation. Yes. This question comes mainly out of Mark Ward's presentation, but, there, but it's an issue that's addressed by lots of people. Redefining the audience. Okay? So you are specifically working on redefining your audience, but there are lots of other hot topics that talked about new ways of defining an audience and new ways of understanding an audience. Whether that audience is going to be um, an audience that that, that, that is able to listen to stories that you haven't heard before, or whether that audience is going to be in a place that you haven't seen before. And I'm really interested in your perspective on that, because where I come from, there are two kinds of theater audiences. There are people whose hair is either whiter or less than mine, who are going to be gone in the next 20 years, okay? Or there are people who are seeing plays for the first time in public parks and places where they don't expect to see them and discovering theater as an art form that they didn't know existed. That's the audience. Those are the two kinds of audiences that we deal with. The people who want to buy season tickets and keep the repertory the same until they pass away and people who might have an who might have a completely new vision of what theater could do, what stories it could tell, and what kind of work it could do in making connections between people and among communities. So what do you see where you are? And what is your work doing to build an audience, not just to expand your subscriber base, but to build a future? Who would like to respond? Would anybody like to respond? Or is that a question we let hang out in the air? I'll try. Uh, okay, yeah. great. I think it's very simple and very complex at the same time. But my answer would be the best way to get an audience into the theater is to show them people on stage who look like them. Not necessarily who think like them, but who look like them. If we don't make theaters comfortable 
uh, and inclusive, and by comfortable, I don't mean comfortable subjects. Right. But if we don't make them inclusive, then why would anybody come in? Why would anybody attend? That relates to what you were saying, Lauren. It does. It does a lot, uh, because a lot of my sources have a lot to do with um, audience development and the, the different um, kind of community engagement strategies um, that have been used. Um, and I think it, uh, along, along with that, I think it also has a lot to do with, with um, listening to communities um, and, and seeing, you know, especially the people who are kind of in between or the people who could be in between, you know, why, why they don't, you know, why they don't come and what they're, what they're looking to see, but also kind of a, a respect for audience, audience tastes and what they want to see because I think there are, there's, there's a lot of people who, who think of thinking of what audience is wanting to see is, is very commercial and kind of detrimental to their art. But if you, if you think, if you really have a respect for the people that you want to bring into your theater and what they're interested in, the topics that are relevant to them and, and, and willing to listen to them and kind of bring together, you know, your artistic sensibilities and, and the kind of things that you're interested in and the kind of things that they're interested in, not only just, you know, passively seeing, but talking about, then I think there can be a, a definite connection between those two things. Mm -hmm. I'll add that um, I think that when we use the kind of old circumscribed model of, you know, subscribers, companies, um, there are some folks in the community that know how those rules work, and there are a lot of folks who don't know how those rules work, and those people are inevitably going to feel unwelcome. Um, I have, I'm really interested in, partly because of my artistic concerns, but also partly in terms of audience relationships. Uh, in, in being really radical about uh, renegotiating those things. So to just say, yeah, like, there, there is no expected relationship. Um, like, you're gonna need to, like, step into a strange place to be able to create a relationship with a work of art. And, and I think then anybody that's willing to take a risk can find a place. One of the people who became a part of the company of our piece um, started out as an audience member and spoke no English, didn't look like any of us, um, and uh, and we had to like figure out how to how to um, include translating for him um, into everything that we did, which was hugely inefficient and totally worthwhile. Uh, I'd like to pick up on on something that you just said because I think there is another connection worth exploring, which is this. Um, feeling unwelcome uh, because I think I think we heard from several people who felt unwelcome in different ways and I wonder if anybody would did you have a question about yeah, that, about that yeah. okay great so I've been thinking about this, this notion of professionalism which is clearly so loaded and um, is it Denise am I yes. for your name right um, you so 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 eloquently sort of opened up to us the fact that professionalism as a concept can be this gateway to racism and oppression, oppression and repression. Um, but then Desiree, in yours, you mentioned that once the MFA student sort of took on the role of director, um, he treated you, your word was unprofessionally. And I'm wondering, um, and made you feel sort of ignored and superfluous, so I'm wondering like, for everyone on stage, but also everyone in the audience as dramaturgs, how are we, how do we conceive of professionalism? How do we use that word? What does it mean? Can it actually be a good thing? Um, and just, I mean, how can we, how can we apply it to our work in a way that creates, you know, professional as in good theater as opposed to professional as in um, elitist theater? So, uh, I mean, my speech was definitely loaded but I'm talking with a lot of experience and not just my own experience I have a lot of refugee artist friends immigrant artist friends who um, uh, went through some really like dramatically absurd and funny uh, conversations uh, because they were not professional and I do have faith in professionalism. Don't like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I do think that all theater practitioners uh, should be treated with respect, uh, should be listened, uh, and that respect includes uh, economic respect also. Like, they should be paid. Uh, I am not against those things. But then there is this other side that I've seen as 
a newcomer that rejects the entire possibility of making theater in other ways that people in other countries actually do. People don't even listen. Like, I wrote my master's thesis in Istanbul about alternative theater field in Istanbul. Those people were not professional in any term that can be described here because they were actually lawyers, uh, medical people, uh, with a variety of uh, professional degrees and they, they were white collar workers and they made money from those things and brought that money together and rented a black box place in the middle of Istanbul and they did professional theater, theater that I'm, that's why I'm in theater. I'm actually an urban planner. My undergrad degree is in urban planning. <laughs> like, but I have seen that and then there was an urban uprising in Istanbul those same black box spaces were used as places that pro protesters were healed, like doctors were helping them there. So like, where does the professionalism fit there? It's a place of life, it's a place of revolution, actual revolution. And then I came with a lot of hope to Toronto, and I'm like incredibly disappointed, I'm sorry, I'm incredibly disappointed. And part of that disappointment comes from the fact that no one wants to listen. No one wants to listen to any other person's experience. They, like, I linguistically think differently. I, like, my entire life experience is dramatically different than yours. I wasn't a racialized body when I came here. I was made into a racialized body after I came here. I didn't define myself as a person of color in Turkey. But I can't have those conversations with anyone. And supposedly theater should be a place that we should have conversations. Mm -hmm. So I kind of gave up. I'm like, OK, I'll try otherwise. I think there's a lot of um, looking back to having uh, connecting with that, I think, looking back to as even the, the histories in our own in our own countries of um, exclusionary practices that um, especially communities of color that have have experienced and, and people with disabilities have experienced that to, at, at this point in time may not even be, people may not be able to exactly finger point and uh, point a finger at and, and explain exactly what it is, but the, the, the wounds are still lingering so much that we, I think we need to, to also one, know about and, and deal with those histories even down to the way that we, the way that we extend the invitation to people to, you know, to come to our theater spaces or to come to the spaces where we're doing theater, so that people will, that people will know that we're we're trying to to change those practices and actually include, as well. Uh, yes. Um, I have so many thoughts listening to all of you, and I'm so uh, thankful to hear all of this. What's really coalescing into my mind is this shift um, between structures and models that have become standardized and a lack of openness towards breaking <coughs> those structures and models. Um, and I think that dramaturgs is people who can see structure and respond to structure that uh, could really be a value in shifting and making sure that, I mean, you, the, the two artists of color on the stage are the two people who are also explaining disappointment with processes, and I think we have to note that. Um, and, you know, thinking about what Tom and Sean were talking about, and talking about how do you look at, at old material and make it new again, one of the things I think we don't spend enough time thinking about is what is the lens we're putting on the art that we're making. And by making something new, who are we making it new for? And how can we involve other structures into making new work or old work new? So rather than just doing an adaptation of an older play, how can we invite an artist with a completely different way of seeing the world, as Denise said, with a completely different background, who doesn't have this in their, you know, upbringing DNA of artistry, to create something that's fresh and new and a, um, 
can recreate how we look at the world. So ironically, acknowledging structure, <laughs> I have to point out that um, it's 11.29. <laughs> there are some, uh, some announcements. Uh, but before those announcements, I wonder, Desiree, I saw you nodding. And I just, I, it seems to me that you were part of a structure that was, you know, that fell apart. Hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard to talk about reshaping structure when we have status in the theater, especially in at least the university that I am in, where the dramaturg is not taken seriously many of times, especially me coming in as a first-time dramaturg, already having the status of the lowest status of a role and having the lowest experience. How do we, as dramaturgs, who are seen oftentimes at lower status, depending on what theaters and what experiences you're at, change structure. It's like also because like we're in a status of dramaturgs, we're in a status of like women <coughs> dramaturgs, of dramaturgs of color. Like how can we make that change when there's other roles way above us? That is an excellent question to launch us into further conversation. Thank you so much.